My name is Scott Shadley, and I'm the VP of Marketing here at NGD Systems. I also sit on the Board of Directors for SNEA, and I'm the co-chair of the Computational Storage Technical Work Group. Today, I'm here in the Computational Storage Track at Storage Developer Conference Virtual Number 2 for 2021. I uh, appreciate you guys sticking around for the last year of dealing with virtual events, and hopefully you don't have event fatigue. Uh, I'm going to do my best to keep it short, sweet, fun, and a little entertaining just so that you're not sitting here staring at me for too long. Uh, my goal today is to introduce you to the NGD system solution for computational storage and specifically how you can use Spark and Kubernetes and a few other fun tools and toys with our devices to help make your solutions more effective at data, anal data analytics, data analysis, and even deploying them in weird and unusual places like ooh, the edge. So while we get into the conversation, I first thought it would always be useful to have that topic be discussed around bringing the real value to data. We all know it, we all need it, yet how do we get there from where we are today? And computational storage does a great job of providing a step forward when it comes to accelerating the results based on stationary data. And we'll explain that a little bit more as we go through the presentation today. So what is the market evolution looking like and the need for local compute and why? It's pretty straightforward. Our friends at Gartner have one of the easiest ways to look at that. And this comes back to this concept of structured and unstructured data. Uh, I love the iceberg representation because it just shows that a lot of us think about how little information we really deal with compared to how much information is actually being generated and how we get between the two. Uh, there's always an interesting thought around the, the iceberg because you have this great mass of data that no one sees, but you still have to deal with it. You can't get away from it, you can't ignore it. And that's one of the beautiful things about this. As you can see highlighted there on the screen, a new way to compute on random local data is needed. Well, that's a thought of what Gartner said when they wrote the report around structured and unstructured data in 2019. Uh, it's been a few years since then. We've had a lot of fun in the working group, and we've had a lot of fun here at NGD Systems helping prove that exact new thing is now available. And why? Again, if you think about it, statist, uh, Statista, however you say that lovely URL that I put there in the notes, uh, says that we're going to have a many, many, many zettabytes of data. And we all know that. IDC says 175 zettabytes by 2025. Zettabytes are not easy to manage. we got to store them somewhere. If you're going to store them, you might as well compute on them. And that's why we have computational storage. So this change in this ecosystem is needed. And there's lots of different ways to get there. Today, I'm going to highlight two and focus on one. So we have our first effort around this was actually displayed last year at VMworld 2020. And I spent quite a bit of time on it last year at SDC. Just to highlight, we're still moving forward with this program. We've now got customers engaged on it. We have a lot of fun things happening there. Uh, this is doing edge deployment of green plum databases. So I'm gonna talk to a whole bunch of different workloads. I've already mentioned Spark and Kubernetes. What about Docker containers? VMware, ESXi, vSphere, all that good stuff. So that project is up and coming. I'll give you a little bit of an update on it in a little bit. And of course, today I'm going to spend a little more time about our friends at Los Alamos National Labs. If you're watching this event in real time, there's a second presentation that is actually being presented by Brad Settlemeyer. He gives you their specific view from Los Alamos National Labs across the entire ecosystem. Today, I'm going to focus on the work that we did with them as part of an announcement over the summer where we brought in a bunch of interns. And I love it and I hate it because interns are wonderful assets to every organization. And I love it because they don't know what they're getting into when they walk in the door. And we, sh we will show you how simple and easy it was for them to get stuff done by using our technology. And I hate it because they're out there gone and we got to continue the work without them. So uh, I appreciate all the effort they put into this summer project. We helped them out a little bit, basically hands off on purpose to show how easy it is to use the NGD system solutions projects. So. Why and how did we end up where we were with that technology? So as we were going through this, we said, well, there's a lot of different ways we can look at computational storage. So what is it that you'd like to accomplish? And so they went off as a, an organization and found a sponsor for their summer internship project. And we ended up with Hoodoo and Spark and uh, our friends at Kubernetes to manage all that. So I'm throwing out all kinds of fun terms because the beauty is it's got nothing to do with the actual application in reality of how we manage the data with the computational storage devices from NGD. That's because, warning, easy button. Yes, our technology is built on a computational storage drive definition from SNEA. 
And in our particular case, we've gone all the way to the point where our device acts as a mini server. We load a Linux OS. It can be Ubuntu, you can be Debian, you can FreeBSD, you can have all kinds of fun different ways you can use it. But the OS on the device can match the OS on the host system, or they can be disparate. It doesn't really matter, heterogeneous or homogeneous. We've actually wrote several papers on that. Uh, but let's just say all you got to do to work with our products is understand the concept of an SSH. And if you're a software user, you know what SSH stands for in the Linux environment. All the code that we're going to talk about today is what I classify as from our government friends, COTS, consumer off the shelf. We do not create any customized versions of any of the applications that we're running on our devices. We are simply moving the compute closer to the data and seeing what happens. And you'll see through the presentation that it is not a perfect solution for everybody. And I admit that wholly, but I definitely know there's quite a few out there that I can certainly help with a great product and solution from NGD system. So stay tuned. Uh, it's a standard off the shelf NVMe drive. You plug it in, it looks, feels, and acts like any other SSD on the market that uses the NVMe protocol, of course. What's unique about our product is it does have that Linux OS, but it is a Linux OS. Anybody in the software ecosystem knows that Linux is a very valuable tool. So uh, intern or experienced, it is just simply that easy to use our technology. And that's really the focus of what we're gonna talk about in the coming slides and effort that we have going here today. So when we talk about experienced or intern and we talk about the different ways to use a product, it's always easiest to think about how we do it with the concept of being the KISS principle. Now, we all know what the final S in that usually stands for, but for a case of what we're talking about today, it is keep it simple and seamless. The less you have to change, the easier it is to integrate, the faster you can transition. So we've done this around the concept of your traditional architecture. You've got your CPU, you've got your memory, you've got your storage. We just happen to throw a little bit of CPU compute right there in that storage device. Yes, so therefore, when you do that, there's multiple ways you can look at integrating with that. There's several presentations at this lovely event that tell you how other people are doing their projects and how their technology works for their solutions. Great ideas, all of them. Each of us have a unique way we do it. Each of us have value we're bringing to the market. And guess what? You're gonna be able to find a way to use one or all of them. I'm looking forward to working with you on mine, of course. Now you can see here's a whole bunch of different workloads, different applications, different technologies that are being highlighted in this nice uh, orange circle, if you will. Those are things we've already done. Those are projects we've already closed with customers. Those are efforts that are being done in all kinds of different workloads. You can talk about being in a CDN, you can talk about being in AI workloads, you can talk about, oh, maybe going to space with some of these things. And yes, sir, I'm not just having fun because uh, Inspiration4 just went up there but we are gonna put computational storage in space by the end of 2022. And we're very excited about that with our friends at the US Space Force. So I'm gonna show you examples of what we've already accomplished. So you can see why the natural progression is to go into a new and innovative next sec segment when we get involved with a new customer or in this case, a special summer program. So Elasticsearch is a very memory focused tool set. This program, this application, this workload, this cool toy, if you will, that a lot of people use is reliant on using memory to do most of the work because historically storage was somewhere to put data, not somewhere to work on data. And so therefore we went with a partner in this particular program to figure out a way to optimize the use of the CPU and memory resources of the server and augment them in a way that actually brings additional value without creating more work. And so in this particular case, we didn't get massive performance results. We're not getting 10x 100x, we got 20%. But you know what? For that same 20% of performance improvement, we reduced the power consumption of the server by 30%. Now folks, we're kind of go carbon neutral. We're getting these data centers run by wind farms and or putting them in cool spaces or in the case of Microsoft, dropping them at the bottom of an ocean. They still need power. By being reducing 30% of the power and getting 20% of the performance, I think that's a win already. So let's keep looking though, you'll see we reduce the amount of DRAM needed in the server by 50% to accomplish this task. That frees it up for other use or reduces the cost of the system. So, hey, look, we can even get into TCO conversations around this technology. And then of course the CPU itself, we took it down to half. Half is pretty good, I would say, when you talk about a very expensive Xeon processor that can run as much 
as the bare metal server you're plugging it into. And that's all done, folks, with a single chip ASIC from NGD being put in parallel on a bunch of different SSDs running where they need to store the data anyway. So again, folks, lots of different ways to deploy this technology, something we've already done. As I mentioned, we had our wonderful vSphere uh, ESXi Bitfusion, throw out a whole bunch of other acronyms. The project with VMware is ongoing. What we did is we took the Green Plum database, which traditionally runs one node per CPU and means if you want 16 nodes, you had 16 servers or at least eight servers with dual core or dual socket systems. And we made it into two servers because each one of those nodes is running in our drive. Now we can optimize in a lot of different ways. We can rewrite code. In this case, we simply put two and two together and made four and that four replaced 16. So I'm pretty excited about that. There's a demo there for you guys to follow up on the VMworld event that's coming up in a couple of weeks. You'll be able to actually watch an update on where we are with this technology and our friends at the office CTO over there. Now we have a couple other workloads we played around with in the past, Hadoop. And you can see there on the right, the Hadoop architecture. Again, we're migrating the data nodes into each of our devices. We're reducing server count and increasing performance. As you can see there at the bottom, a, a nice sort impl implementation called TerraSort. If you just ran it on our drives with just a couple of drives in place, guess what? It's not gonna work as well, but as you scale it and you have to scale it because Hadoop is big data, we can actually outperform the processor on the host system for this type of workload. So this is an example of where ones or twos don't work, but 24s and larger work wonderfully. And then there on the left, you can see that's a TCO calculator. So on the Mongo database, we started playing around with the shards and the different aspects of how to deploy the data. So again, we didn't rewrite it, we optimized the layout of the data and we were able to show that even the CapEx and OpEx of a CSD-based system, an NVMe SSD-based system that has compute by taking and moving and migrating the shards and other aspects of the Mongo management into our devices, we can reduce and make it less expensive for you than to purchase a spinning rust hard drive based system that's shown on the left. So can it be done? Can I make computational storage less expensive than a hard drive? This is a perfect proof point where we can actually make that happen. If you want to find out more, we have a wonderful white paper on this TCO model and how we built it on our website, and you'll have links to that at the end of the presentation. So. Now that we've talked a little about where we've been, I promised you something around this concept of Spark and Kubernetes. So let's go ahead and jump over to that focus. So what we're gonna talk about next is, uh, I'm gonna spend some time going through how you'd actually deploy it. I'm gonna pull up some lines of code folks here. Yes, we are gonna get into terminals. Now, of course, this is a recorded presentation and it's on PowerPoint and yes, folks, I am a marketing guy, but I do have history as an engineer. So I will be able to hopefully give you in some insight and no, I'm not giving it all away because it's only 20 minutes plus, and I would like to actually hear from you so you can see how we did it, not necessarily just walk through it and do it yourself. So de developed, deployed, and demonstrated. We're going to start with an engagement model with our friends at Los Alamos National Labs and what we did to help work around that and what we did on our own to get an end result where you can see there that is the output of a Spark cluster as represented inside the OS on a device in the server. That is not the host showing that output. That is the server in the drive. Yes, folks, computational storage drives can output real fun things. So how do we get there? Well, we need to do a bunch of different things. So we did it. Uh, we took some tools and we put them together and we utilized off the shelf. Again, I'm going to keep focusing on it, folks. It's that easy. It's off the shelf. We're going to use containerized applications. We're going to use Kubernetes, in this case, the K3S implementation to manage our containerized environment. We're gonna have a Hadoop database installed on this particular sucker, and then we're gonna use Spark to manage it. And as you can see there in the lines of code, the devices show up on the screen right there in the middle as NVMe devices. There's nothing fancy, they're plug and play. And now when it comes to managing this particular device, we need a fun little tool called NVMe, NVMe CLI. Yes, it's just a command line interface for an NVMe device being able to be managed by Linux OS. Now you'll see as we go through this, that term root at in situ machine two, we call the technology within our computational star storage drive in situ processing. That is Latin for processing within. Hey, fun terms, right? Uh, I, wanted to, I do wanna highlight that all the codes that we use to generate this output 
and what we provided to our partners is available as open source on GitHub. So this is the first time I brought it to light that we do actually, yes, folks make it public. You can get the scripts and everything to run these types of things on our devices. Now it's open source code, it's off the shelf code, but you do have to have a NVMe SSD that runs a Linux OS. When you find another one, let me know. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. So the only one, only thing we have to do is run a simple shell command called in situ control new port. It's installed in every single device that we ship out the door. Once you do that, you start to see there on the command line interface output screens that we have it talking about creating IP addresses for all of the different CSDs within this particular server. And all of those IP addresses become our pathway to do TCP over NVMe. So you've heard a lot in the marketplace about NVMe over TCP. We're doing it the other way around. Yes, folks, we are talking to the guys doing NVMe over TCP so that we all work well together. That's absolutely part of the ecosystem the evolution of our technologies. But that's it. One simple tool, one simple command. It does all the work in the background. It comes installed on the devices. So all you have to do is run that shell code. And once you do that, you can see there on the bottom output screen, we have an Ubuntu Linux OS environment now ready to be used on the device and it's called node one. So NGD at node one now becomes the interface and the window where we do all the work of populating the internal OS with the Kubernetes cluster and getting the Spark platform working out for us. So in order to do that, uh, we found out that in order to manage the best number of CSD nodes was to use Spark as part of a Kubernetes cluster. And as doing that, we decided to go out to the Docker workload platform and there's a nice little app store out there, downloaded what we needed and ran off the shelf commands to install the Docker containers that there are therefore creating the uh, K3S environment. So to make it even easier, we also used, uh, put the GitHub information out there as well. So throughout the rest of this, we have the opportunity to showcase again, how we're using this stuff with open source off the shelf code. And once so we get the uh, Kubernetes cluster going, we fire off the commands, as you can see here. And one line of code, we have Spark running. I kind of like it when it's that easy. So we open up the container, we create the environment, we populate that environment, and we execute the code. And all of a sudden, node one is now presenting itself with a Spark cluster. So you, it is very functional, it's very easy to work with. And it's a lot of fun in order to be able to showcase how simple and fast. I mean, the ability to actually put Kubernetes through containerized environments, getting a Spark cluster up and running. I did it in three slides with six pictures. Yes, it takes a little bit more of code work, folks. Yes, I'm not a software guy. I'm a hardware guy and a marketing guy. But it's that easy. I wanted to showcase how simple, fast, and efficient you could actually generate these particular workloads. And then now let's take a look. Now there's two aspects of what's gonna happen next. So first I'm gonna show you our results because we did some workloads of testing of our own. And of course, I'm then gonna compare it with our friends at Los Alamos. They did a wonderful presentation that's available at a public URL that I've included at the end of this presentation. And you're welcome to go grab that. I have holistically captured their slides. So I have not dis disseminating anything that's not public information. And for our particular workload, we have a system that's hooked up with 20 derives in the box. And as we scale across those 20 drives, you can see here the speed up, how much faster the application is able to execute its commands is shown by the elevation of the bars. So the host only on the left is 1.0 as one would expect, that's your control. And when we got the 20 drives up and running, we have a 0.47 or 47% faster. Yes, folks, 1.5 times faster uh, execution of the code that's going on. And of course, if we were able to add more nodes, if we were able to scale out the system, put it across multiple servers, we're gonna get that even better acceleration factor for these particular things. Uh, think about it, if I've got 20 now and I'm at 1.5, what happens when I get to 32 or 36 with the E1S form factor that we can support because we do have that ASIC based design. Now our friends at um, Los Alamos National Labs had access to an eight drive system that they've acquired. And in their particular case, they ran a slightly different workload and their output shows in time to complete not an acceleration factor. So as we go to the right on their results screen here, you can see that the amount of time it takes to complete the task reduces by the number of cores that are within the drives that they're running. So in this case, I show 24 cores as the maximum number, that's six devices, folks. Four times six is 24, and there's four cores per drive. Um, 
But you can also see that their observation is just as we would expect that you can get better performance by having more devices in the system and that there are opportunities to accelerate workloads and gain performance benefits by working on the data locally. Now, of course, everyone's going to say, well, yeah, you've, you've baited the, the witness, you've done all this kind of stuff. What about the real life expectations of this workload? Yes, folks, there is a catch and there's not a catch really. It's not a one size fits all. Yes, our product has some capabilities that it is, any, is not as efficient as doing as the host can do, for example. So if you look here, this is output that we put together running a bunch of different machine learning models on our device using that Sp the Spark workload and Hadoop infrastructure. There's multiple different configurations. Again, how many devices are active from five to 20. And then the host is the control shown there as well. And you can see the control speed up is at one for the host environment. And you'll notice that several of these particular outputs show that using any configuration of our drives with the active uh, application running on our CSDs is faster than running it on the host. You'll see in some cases that running it on our devices gets slower than running it on the host. And yes, we do know that's true and it will happen. There are plenty of examples in this world where you can scale out architectures and you can actually see performance degradation over time. So again, don't think of this thing as it's gonna solve every problem on the market. We do have workloads that are not this uh, best suited for it. Memory centric, as I mentioned, Elasticsearch is not as optimizable because it has everything in RAM. Think of your everybody's favorite Oracle Exa database. It's running on RAM, it's not running on storage, folks. So if it's storage centric workloads, AI inferencing, great workload. I could show you all day long how I get 100X and 500X type acceleration factors out of that. But you also have the concept of how much data. The lower the data volume, the smaller the data size, the dot smaller the data set, the less you can accelerate it. It's simple math. If I can move an entire data set into memory and operate on it and then do it with the host CPU, if you've got the accessible CPU cycles, you're gonna accomplish the task a little bit faster. It's that simple. But we're not trying to replace CPUs in any of the workloads that we're doing. This is called supporting, augmenting, dare I use the term offloading. Now, there are reasons why that is, and that has a lot to do with the current compute and storage and memory infrastructure. As we migrate that, modify that, if I were to take some of these codes and optimize, rewrite the software to work better on our work, on our devices the way that they're designed, as we've shown in several different examples in previous presentations, Yes, you can get some amazing acceleration, but in this particular case, we're not modifying code. We're doing that on purpose. But if you've got to move data and you've got to move a lot of it, we can help and it will happen. Now, our friends at Los Alamos National Labs did highlight that if you do run small data sets across our devices versus across the host system, the host system is going to be faster. And that's what I was trying to highlight on the last slide. So core to core performance is possible. We can even see in a lot of cases where our drive will be on a core to core equivalent to a core, one core within an x86 processor, but we can still augment. Just think about the simple fact that in this particular output, they set, they highlight that the host got it done faster. What if the host isn't available? What if I don't want to burden the host with doing this workload? It can be accomplished now somewhere else. It doesn't have to be a high performance, high power GPU. It doesn't have to be a DPU where data is non-permanent, non-sticky. Non it can be done in the storage device and you just kick it off, let it run. When it's done, you get back the data. So you have to think about the way that you're using these, how they're gonna be benefiting you and what you need to do with your CPU and memory that are wrapped around this. Again, it's optimization, augmentation and supporting in, in existing infrastructures with no changes to code. We wanna keep it simple and seamless. Now, as we evolve these technologies and we start getting the architectural document from SNEF finalized and we start getting additional work done and we keep working with more and more partners, of course, we're gonna see a better and final um, example of how we can truly deploy these. And I bring that up with these because these are a couple of partnerships where we're doing just that. So we do have work in progress to put a computational storage database accelerated platform in space and yes, folks, it is with the US Space Force. Uh, we are using their resources, tools, and partners to uh, define a satellite-based architectural system that's gonna have anywhere from four to eight of our drives flying around in every satellite. So great example of how you can go as far to the edge as humanly possible. Uh, we have additional customer POC counts increasing 
We built, because of our wonderful friend COVID, we built a remote environment that's got a wait list for people to actually utilize some of our drives to do some offload work. And again, if you go to our resources section on the collateral page, we have some videos of some of our friends actually telling you how they did it. My personal favorite is how we could OCR any document and image on the planet with very little effort. Uh, and that was also, again, using off the shelf applications. Now, the particular VMware project that we're working on has multiple phases to that particular program. We've gotten past phases where we've done the very simple workload management. We're actually starting to do some optimization efforts on that. And you'll hear an update from them during their event at VMworld 2021. And we'll, of course, be putting out some more information on that via a lot of the different resources, including white papers and reference architectures. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and of course, we're continuing to refine workloads across many different segments. Uh, we've got AI and ML white papers and or scientific papers that have been published anywhere from the ACM journal to all kinds of different IEEE's and other aspects of different shows and events and uh, our educational outreach platforms. We support a lot of different universities today with different uh, programs for being able to help deploy computational storage faster. Um, databases, we've shown you quite a few of those. The media and entertainment space is a great new opportunity for us with all of those wonderful pops and the fact that we all went streaming and we're not doing as much traveling, uh, which then of course brings us from m and &E straight into CDN, the content delivery network platform that delivers that streaming content that the m and &E guys are generating. Yes, we can run both sets of workloads on these particular fun, cool devices. And then of course, things like video surveillance, think about having each and every one of your cameras self-tracking no host system, no cloud attached. You could actually have an individual device actually doing object detection and sending the data out as result files, not immediate data raw formats. Shrink the amount of data you move, send the amount of data that's valuable to process. And then in my final example, we're actually working with a, comp a company and they, nicked it <laughs> and they nicknamed their platform the Pac-Man trucking platform. Think of going around with service vehicles that are trying to find and monitor for leaks of different types of things. You could call it EMI, you could call it even methane. Our friends at ExxonMobil have a great platform around methane detection. But what if I optimize the routes of traffic of all my service vehicles to go a little out of their way, but to be able to scan for those leaks more effectively? So I'm literally laying the dots to make sure that the other guys don't drive over the dots. And so it's kind of a unique way to do it, but just think again, edge computing, deploying in vehicles, deploying in random environments. And these things, yes, folks can work minus 40 to 85. We've got industrial customers today. We have more coming and we have the capability because it's an ASIC based hardened solution that runs a Linux OS that has all of your enterprise SSD requirements and temp ranges. We know what we're doing here, folks. So uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're continuing to see a lot of work moving forward and we're excited about what is coming next. So what do we offer you today? We offer a large breadth of standard off the shelf NVMe SSDs at the largest capacity on the planet for any given form factor. Feel free to go look. And I would love an email if you find somebody, same form factor, same capacity, same feature set, same power envelope. You can have some fun trying to do that because we also have the most power efficiency of any of the devices out there in the market today, as you can see by that graph on the bottom right. And all of these products have that quad core computational storage CPU resource available. Uh, compliments to our friends at ARM uh, for developing some cool technology we were able to deploy in our particular devices. We do use ARM CPUs today. If you want to learn some more about those, go see my co-chair Jason Mulgard's presentation on behalf of ARM around all the cool things that they're doing that are gonna help make our next generation product that much more fun too. Uh, so all of the products are shipping now with the exception of the, the shorter M.2 module. Apparently that people like it to be fitting in even smaller form factors. Yes, did I mention we're going to space? We're in the trunks of cars. Computational storage can go everywhere if you've got an ASIC based CPU enabled computational storage drive. And we're gonna bring out our best friends at, uh, at HPE, they were very kind to highlight that the E3 module represents one of the best ways to move forward for data center deployments. We've got that particular product coming in Q1. Uh, that'll be 64 terabytes. And guys, if you want QLC capacities, just do 1.4, 1.5X, what you see there. So we're talking 80 terabytes at very cost-effective hard drive replacement. The spinning rust is going to go away. 
is not only now are we giving you much more data to store in a single envelope, we can compute on it, we can bring value to it much more efficiently. That 3x burden of concern for SSDs to uh, HCVs, well, we can bring it even lower if you take into the TCO of the comp computational storage resources that we provide. So we're not the only ones doing this, as you can tell by the 12 different presentations at this lovely event. Uh, SNIA, we gave you a great update between Jason and I in another con concurrent presentation. Please do make sure and watch that if you have not had a chance to see what SNIA and NVMe are up to. And you can see below, these are a number of different companies, organizations, or members of the working group that have, are working on, or have discussed computational storage publicly in the market. So if you're curious to learn more about that and what's going on in the standards work, feel free to reach out on behalf of your SNIA interest or reach out to either SNIA directly or the NVMe working group, they'll be happy to show you. So I gotta leave you with why computational storage and an on-drive OS. Well, it's about data folks. It's all about the data. Nothing I've talked about today has anything to do with the coolness of my technology or why it's of value other than the fact that it's working on data where the data is stored. So on the left here, you can see what I've used to represent the data locality of stored data to other pre-processing, post-processing capabilities. You've got your CPU, has the greatest distance. It must go through memory, it must be moved out of the storage device, and it must be operated on in memory, which is volatile, which we then for have things like NVDIM and cool new Optane type products, but it has to be put back somewhere, back into storage. That round trip can take forever when we're talking nanoseconds of response time. So we created these cool things of GPUs and now what we also classify as smart NICs. Uh, those products have another offload capability. Again, nothing's non-volatile. It's all at risk when being processed in that place. So not only is it further away from where the data is actually intact, but it's closer to the data, but it's still just as much at risk. So there's great use cases for these folks. Do not get me wrong. I'm not trying to take a GPU out of its socket. If you need real-time instantaneous analytics for the front forward facing camera of a uh, accident preventing autonomous car, that GPU in that box is still going to be there. If you need LiDAR support, if you need the capability to look around the vehicle and see what's going on, if you wanna be able to help with the mapping and traffic flows and things like that, that's what CSDs are for. The data is there, process it where it's local, send the results out, make value of it. We also have CSPs, yes. SNIA has developed a computational storage processor that is a computational storage resource, could be an OS-based device, it can be an FPGA-based device, it can be all kinds of different things, but non-persistent storage. So it's closer, but not at the storage point. And our DPU friends can sit somewhere between the GPU, the DPU, the CSP, we've got all these three-letter acronyms, it's wonderful, I love it, I wanna keep them all going. We're continuing to work from both a SNIA point of view and me as a vendor talking to other vendors, about how we can partner in these different projects. Every single thing on this page has a value, has a need, and has a place to be. In the particular case of what we're talking about, when you've got data stored in storage, far right bottom bubble, and you've got a CPU sitting right next to it, and you've got an OS sitting right there with it, you can see that nice little center overlap. That's where your data resides. If I don't have to move it, I can have all three of those things operating on it, why wouldn't I? And that's what computational storage drives from NGD solution. NGD systems are providing it as a solution for you today. Local data processing. So with that, folks, I'll leave you with a few links. If you go ahead and download the slides, you'll get links to both Twitter and email addresses, as well as the links, the different presentations and announcements that I referenced throughout this presentation. Uh, everything that I borrowed from our friends at Los Alamos is part of the partnership we had with the intern program there. And again, that slide deck is there. I did not use or misuse any of that information. So please feel free to go double check your facts. And if you have any questions, let me know. And as always, as we end the presentation, please take a moment to rate the session. Let me know if I did a good job, if I kept you awake and if I was fast enough that I didn't keep you completely overwhelmed with information, but kept it, one, kept it fun, warm and inviting. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the SDC event. Take care and we will be in touch. And I look forward to seeing you all in person, face to face, as soon as the environment allows. So have a great rest of the event and talk soon. Again, once again, I'm Scott Shadley, VP of Marketing at NGD Systems. <laughs>